Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, earlier this month there was on the news a story about a group attacking a gay couple that occurred in Philadelphia, which ironically in Greek is the city of brotherly love. By what authority did this attack take place? Well, some refer to the fact that uh, the rationale behind this is something that is a condition that is called homophobia. And Webster's Dictionary defines it as this, the irrational fear of, aversion to, or the discrimination against homosexuals. But just maybe the authority that produced this attack came from the church where our fundamental brothers and sisters sometimes have posters that they wave in front of other folks that say, God hates fags. A friend of the couple who did an interview with one of the TV stations in Philadelphia said that the couple was passing this group as they were crossing the street and someone from the group turned and said, is that your blank boyfriend? And victim A turned back and said, yes, that's my boyfriend. Is that an issue? And then the group began their attack. Now in every story there are always two sides and we only have this one. But power and authority have always been and probably always will be a standing critical issue for our society. Without authority and authority in power, civilization breeds only chaos. This was one of the chief reasons that God gave Israel the Ten Commandments, to bring the authority of God into play in their everyday lives, in their relationship to God and in their relationship to each other. And without the power to enforce the authority delegated, chaos continues to reign and continues to be unruly. Just take a look at Ferguson and what has happened out there. This example from Philadelphia is indeed an extreme one. But Jesus often used extremes to get his teaching points across. When Jesus was asked by what authority he, after going to the temple the day before and throwing out the money changers and overturning the tables, was back the next day teaching in the temple, he asked his inquisitors a question about the baptism of John. Did it come from heaven or was it of human origin? And probably what we have in the scripture is one of the most honest answers given by anyone in authority in the temple. And the answer was four words long. We do not know. Though we are the leaders of the temple, we cannot act as judge over God. And our answer would put us in judgment of something that we would question and of others who would question us by the response we would make. And yet, as humans, we do act as God's judge all the time. This came home profoundly for me during an ethics course in seminary when years, and that was years ago, when we had to read a small book that was entitled, Come Let Us Play God. And it was about how major decisions in life that we make, we make them as self-appointed judges of God's will. Things like euthanasia or end of life decisions capital punishment, abortion, birth control, the place of women in society because biblical times women did not have the same place in societies they do today. 
care of the earth, ecology. And the list goes on and on and on. And it also talked about so, so many not so major decisions, like the impact of faith development if the vows that we make when we have our children baptized are not taken seriously and are not lived out in the lives of our children for our children, or if our lifestyle decisions themselves don't necessarily include God in them. We do not know was not an answer in ignorance, but it was a confession of place. We are not God. For you see, there were no more learned people of the Old Testament than the priests and the leaders of the temple. They were not ignorant of what the Scripture shared. And their answers did not convict them of never opening their version of Scripture. It simply said, we are not God. We cannot put ourselves into that place of judgment. And as Jesus returned to the temple the day after he cleared it, suggested that neither the temple challenge that he put forth, nor the cursing of the fig tree, which happened after he left the temple, were intended to symbolize the destruction of the temple or of its practices. Jesus' desire was to restore the temple to its proper function. And by what authority? As the Son of God, as the Word made flesh. We need to turn Jesus' clever question of authority on the church itself and on ourselves as those who are entrusted with the leadership of the church. It is true before Christ there are many things to which we can answer we do not know, like the leaders who address Jesus. And we, the church, we get so wrapped up in the non-essentials, what Martin Luther called the adiaphora, in judging and in gatekeeping, and we forget whose authority we stand under. You know, like the sons in the second half of our reading today, neither got it right. But that shouldn't stop us from doing what we can to get it right. For the sake of one another, and also for the sake of those who will follow after us. That's Jesus' challenge for us, as it was for the leaders of the temple. And it only happens as we continually seek to learn God's will for us, as we open the sacred writings and engage God in life. May God grant us the will and the desire to continue to do that, to follow him in life. Amen.